Call girls and coke surgeons undoing. Drug addicted doctor spends $56,000 at brothel in single visit. 25 hour binge with women and drugs. This is going to be the public face of Dr. Suresh Nair from now on. He was the doctor, a brain surgeon, who on two occasions allowed two escorts or prostitutes to die from a cocaine overdose, thus betraying one of the most precious oaths of all time, the Hippocratic Oath, which says, first, do no harm. And also the Australian Medical Association's Code of Ethics, which said, first of all, consider the well-being of your patient. I was Suresh Nair's neighbour, but yet I never met him. Never saw him coming through the door, going to his post box, meeting him on the stairs. Because I live on the ground floor of this 100-year-old block in Sydney's Elizabeth Bay, which now has become notorious as a drug den, as a luxury apartment of decadence. It isn't, of course. It's just like every other community of people. All kinds of people live here. But Suresh Nair lived here for two years. How did I first hear of his crimes? It was one Monday morning. I was putting out the rubbish, and suddenly, through the door, came detectives and policemen. They went upstairs to his penthouse apartment, and some time later, a body was brought down on a gurney. I didn't see the body, but it was of a young woman who had been called to the apartment the night before for a party, a party involving huge amounts of cocaine and other girls were also in attendance. Our reaction in the building? Not again. Because in the February of 2009, another girl had been found in Suresh's apartment who had subsequently died. That's two dead young women in one apartment in one building in Sydney. I went to the committal hearing and saw Suresh for the first time. I was sitting only a few feet away from him in the court. He showed no emotion. He occasionally wrote something down on a pad. The only time he really seemed to take any notice of anything was when one of the escorts, a very pretty young woman, blonde hair, very much like well, Sandra Dee or Olivia Newton-John in her Greece phase was talking about their meeting. They met at a hotel. He invited her to go into the toilet where they did a line of coke and they came back to his apartment and had sex. They met a few weeks later. They didn't do a line of coke. They just had sex. She spoke of Suresh as being sweet, romantic and not at all the monster that he was being portrayed as by other girls and also by the media. I also met a couple who were the friends of the parents of Suresh's girlfriend, fiancé, who I had met in the past. And they said to me that she had no idea that Suresh was doing any of these things, which was very surprising because Suresh had been using cocaine really since about 2004. I also met, on another occasion, someone who worked in the operating theatre at Nepean Private Hospital, where Suresh was a brain surgeon. She described Suresh as a naughty boy, and everyone knew that he was erratic, and the possibility that his erraticism was because of drug use. So my question is, when does a naughty boy become a naughty man? And when does a naughty man become a bad man? When does a bad man become an evil man? And when does an evil man become a monster? Because the Suresh Nair that lived in this building was quiet. He never caused any trouble. And a friend of mine here, she had stage four cancer. 
She said Suresh spent hours with her, talking about possible treatments, giving her support, total focus and understanding. Someone else in the building said that Suresh was probably the nearest to a genius that he'd ever met, as long as you talked about brain surgery, because both of these people said he had no social graces, he was very awkward, he was like a teenage boy, they said, he, he rocked from side to side, he'd stand and be very awkward and move from one foot to the other and not really have any small talk at all. And this seems to be the general picture of Suresh Nair, brain surgeon who spent something like 11 or 12 years training to do this incredibly intricate work on strangers' brains and spines. He had a fiance, as I've said, but where she went to, I don't know. She was never mentioned in the media reports. It was also not mentioned that the first girl who had the seizure at his apartment, he performed CPR on her. He rang the brothel and told the brothel that she was in dire straits and for them to ring the police. He then said he couldn't cope and had to get away. So was he a monster? Was he irresponsible? Certainly irresponsible if you think that a doctor has always to be responsible. But a doctor's a human being. A doctor also gets tired, emotional, erratic. The idea that the brain surgeon is calm and cool and collected at all times, that's a big ask, isn't it? How does it feel to hold someone's life in your hands? Not just someone's physical existence, but to cut into the stuff that holds thought feeling and reason. Operations on the brain and spine carry grave risks. That's why neurosurgeons are paid a lot of money. So Resh was probably being paid about 700,000, probably up to a million dollars. Um, but what were the expectations on Suresh Nair as a man? What were the expectations on him as a young man growing up with a Malaysian Indian family background in Sydney? I would say they were massive. The training, the sacrifice, the years of study, the sleepless nights, the worry later on when you have total responsibility for a stranger if something goes wrong. If something goes wrong in brain surgery or spinal surgery, it really goes wrong. It could stop somebody from walking. It could stop someone from speaking, seeing, thinking being. That's a huge responsibility. So when we consider Suresh Nair, who is now back in Malaysia, he hasn't lived there since he was 10 years old, consider the brain, that incredibly complex organ, and consider the mind within the brain, which contains so many different compartments. So it's easy for us to call him Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, isn't it? Think of the responsibility a brain surgeon has. What do we say? Well, it's not exactly brain surgery, is it? We say that quite a lot, don't we? Because we see brain surgery as being the province of only very, very intelligent, skilled people, which is true. But very, very intelligent and skilled people also have human emotions. They also have human desires. They're also propelled by mad and crazy thoughts, just as, well, you and I are, aren't we, sometimes? Should we really hold doctors not only accountable, which is right and proper, and certainly this case, if nothing else, has tightened the rules in terms of doctors who are behaving in a strange and inappropriate way. Maybe those girls' deaths have achieved something, and I hope that their families who are grieving and the girls who are also in that apartment who saw those two girls die I hope they feel that something good has been achieved out of this horror story. But there's sure to be a tourist group being taken around Sydney, probably under the umbrella of sordid Sydney, or Sydney After Dark, or murderous Sydney, or monstrous Sydney, or monsters of Sydney, or black museum of Sydney. And they'll come past this apartment, which, as I say, is a hundred years old, 
and contains a lot of very different people. And they'll look at it and they'll just see drugs and murder and prostitutes. I wonder if perhaps the training of doctors could include a little bit more about the heart as well as the head and the mind. That maybe, and this may be sounding facetious, but I mean it sincerely, that maybe the training of a top-class prostitute could also be included in the training of a top-class doctor. Because prostitutes, although they have a very low social standing, are regarded by many as fine counsellors. They listen to the soul of men and women. They listen. They allow themselves to be touched. Because a lot of men and women need the touch of flesh. And shall we just think that Suresh, who would be looking at brains and spines and dealing with people's anxieties and fears, and maybe, yes, after a successful operation, he'd get a big high and it would be marvellous, but what if it went wrong? How would he feel then? Because sometimes it does go wrong, because surgeons don't always get it right. So maybe we should look not just at the brain and not just at the mind, but also connecting it with the heart, with the emotions, and perhaps being a little bit more understanding of other people's emotional truth, which is that sometimes there's a scream inside the calmest of people.